Well, I'm so pleased to be with you today representing the BSC Steering Committee. Um, I'm Cynthia Ryder at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, and I'll be giving you a little bit of an overview and some updates on our activities over the last year. But before I get into updates, um, I just want to go over some background information for anyone who is joining us for the first time this year. We like to start out by talking about how botanicals are complex mixtures. Plants are chemical factories. They make a ton of secondary metabolites that exhibit a broad range of bioactivities. And many constituents from plants have been harnessed to use as pesticides, pharmaceuticals, poisons, and other consumer product ingredients. So this lovely infomercial from the Q Royal Botanic Garden State of the World's Plants report of 2017 um, demonstrates that over 28,000 plant species are currently recorded as being of medicinal use. However, of those 28,000, less than 16% are actually cited in a regulatory medicinal publication. So it just goes to show that a lot of these are being used off the books um, for medicinal purposes. So botanicals are complex, not only that, they are variable and there are many different sources of that variability that range from different growing conditions to how we harvest them. Um, processing can differ from manufacturer to manufacturer and then you run up against exposure variations like how is this botanical been stored? What is the compliance with recommended doses? And then um, how long do people take botanicals? Um, what's their background genetics or age or pre-existing conditions and other co-exposures that all influence the variability that we see in responding to botanicals? So botanicals are complex, they're variable, and a whole lot of people use botanicals. So here I'm just presenting figures from the US because of this lovely pub publication in Herbalgram, the annual market report that um, nicely captures information on use of botanicals, but of course they are used globally all over the world. Um, so you can see in the figure on the right that there's been a, a monotonic increase in sales of herbal supplements and it's up to almost $13 billion in the US. So they're complex, they're variable and everybody uses them it becomes really important to ask, how do we ensure the safety of botanicals? And here it's important to note that the whole structure of toxicity testing, safety evaluation, and risk assessment has really been developed and optimized for single chemicals. So in order to evaluate the safety of these botanicals, we really need to focus on some critical features of safety testing methods. We need our methods to be reliable and reproducible, efficient, cost-effective, human-relevant, compatible with complex mixtures being very important. Um, we need them to cover a broad range of biological space and hopefully not reliant on mammalian models alone, because we know in this sphere, it's very important to people um, to reduce and practice the three R's in animal welfare. So there are many established um, testing methods for single chemicals. And over the years, many people have tried to apply those to mixtures. And here I just highlight two examples of this that are relevant to the Botanical Safety Consortium. One by the EPA in the top panel, they tested a series of fruit and vegetable extracts in their ToxCast system. And then the bottom one is from the Division of Translational Toxicology, where we tested a lot of botanical ingredients in our Tox21 high throughput screening assays. But the thing to note in both of these cases is we're kind of just throwing these extracts into these established test systems and asking what happens, what's the activity that we see. We're not really evaluating the applicability of these assays to these new complex mixtures. And that is where the Botanical Safety Consortium can really come in and help. So the Botanical Safety Consortium um, started 
probably through ICSB discussions a couple years before it was officially started, but the official announcement came in 2019 when we solidified the Botanical Safety Consortium through a memorandum of understanding between the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, the FDA, and HESI. So since that 2019 formation, we've made a lot of progress. As Connie mentioned briefly, here are the numbers on the Botanical Safety Consortium. So we've been active for three years. We have 88 members of technical working groups, 157 members on the Stakeholder Council, we have 54 different supporting organizations, 10 Botanical Safety Consortium supported sessions at international conferences, 170 participants at the 2022, so last year's virtual meeting. We have 13 initial test botanical extracts, and we added three more for neuro and cardio evaluation. We have 15 plus new approach methodologies that we're evaluating. We have over a million dollars in federal funding to support the very important management of the BSC and over 600,000 in private sector funds that supports laboratory work. We have 11 working groups with monthly calls and four publications with numerous more in preparation, which I'll tell you about in a few slides. So really the overarching charge of the Botanical Safety Consortium is to evaluate the suitability of toxicity assays for use with botanicals, which are complex mixtures. Our short-term goal is really to identify and evaluate new approach methodologies for use with these botanicals, but downstream, our long-term goal is to eventually get to a place where we can develop a testing strategy and framework to evaluate botanical safety. And at this point, it's always important to cover a little bit about what we are not doing. So what we're not doing, and some of this we're not doing currently, some of this we're never going to do, but we're not making safety determinations of individual botanical ingredients. We're also not making regulatory decisions or trying to influence regulation. We aren't endorsing any particular product. We're not testing off the shelf products. So we're not testing specific manufactured products. We're not testing individual constituents of botanicals unless we're using them specifically as negative or positive controls in an assay. We're not performing mammalian in vivo studies, and this will never be part of the Botanical Safety Consortium. We are not performing risk assessments, and we are not validating methods. That has a very specific meaning. So what we are doing, we are engaging, we're connecting with the broad group of global stakeholders to leverage the best scientific approaches. We're characterizing, we're establishing the appropriate levels of chemical characterization for complex botanical ingredients. We're developing tools, so identifying those pragmatic, fit for purpose, in vitro and in silico assays to evaluate botanical safety. We're evaluating those tools we're integrating data across these different assays and toxicities, and throughout the whole process, we're communicating, as we're doing today, to share our advances and results via peer-reviewed publications, presentations, and through our web um, presence. So to go over the strategy of how we're accomplishing all these things, we started by identifying priority toxicity endpoints. So these are how we built our technical working groups. What are the toxicities that we're particularly worried about for botanicals? Um, next, we formed the technical working groups and asked them to do two main things, identify candidates, um, botanical ingredients, that should be positive and negative for their toxicity and also identify assays and approaches that might be good for testing those botanicals. So next we went into the chemical analysis phase 
And having completed that, we've built the botanical library and compiled the assays and approaches that we want to use. And we're at the stage now where we're evaluating that botanical library in multiple different labs and assays. And next we'll be doing a lot of analysis and a lot of reporting. And finally getting to that end goal of building the framework and toolbox for evaluating botanical safety, hopefully downstream. So here's a snapshot of the different work groups and we can put them into three different categories. So we have the toxicity endpoints. So the endpoints we wanted to focus on that include cardiotoxicity, hepatotoxicity, neurotoxicity, developmental and reproductive toxicity, genotoxicity, and we have recently added dermal toxicity, which kind of spans both toxicity and exposure, because we are moving into worrying about also dermal um, exposures instead of focusing as we had been solely on oral exposures. So um, we also have some groups that are focused specifically on exposure and toxicokinetics. That includes now our newly formed dermal group, as well as a group that's focused on absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination, and um, one that's focused on botanical drug interactions specifically. And then we have our analysis groups that are really cross-cutting. They're helping all of the different groups, our in vitro to in vivo extrapolation group that's trying to look at how we can compare our in vitro dosing to what humans actually see. Um, then we have our chemical analysis group that is incredibly important for all we do, and our data analysis group that will be ramping up work as we start to get in data, and our pharmacognosy group, which cuts across all of these and provides us advice on the botanicals themselves. So as I mentioned, we asked our technical working groups to focus on two main activities. The first was to nominate botanicals. So how did they decide on which botanicals to choose? They looked for toxicity information from all sources. So looking for preclinical evidence, including rodent studies or other um, mammalian organism studies, uh, human evidence, which included both clinical evidence as well as any kind of adverse event reporting, and then in vitro evidence or mechanistic understanding of that botanical ingredient and its toxicity for that endpoint. We also asked them to think about whether the toxic constituent was known, that would be a benefit um, in future interpretation, and whether it is available from reputable sources. And here we relied really heavily on our pharmacognosy group. And if there were robust analytical methods already available for that ingredient, that's a plus. We also asked them to look at identifying assays and how did they identify assays? This was based on trying to get good biological coverage of the important endpoints and processes for that toxicity. Second, we of course want reliable and reproducible assays. We want them to be somewhat sensitive because in this case, safety assessment means minimizing false negatives. We also want them to be human relevant and ideally commercially available so that they can be accessed by other groups. So this is our current Botanical Safety Consortium library. And the first thing people note is not all of these botanical ingredients are used in dietary supplements. Um, we specifically focused on some with very well-known toxicities like Aristolochia, which has Aristolochic acid and is a known genotoxicant, ephedra, known to be cardiotoxic, and oleander, which is definitely poisonous. So um, these were chosen because they, they are complex mixtures, complex plant mixtures with known toxicities. So again, we're not trying to evaluate the safety of specific ingredients. Then we have others like ginseng and milk thistle, which have been very thoroughly evaluated um, in animal studies and two-year cancer bioassays. These have been selected as pan-negative botanical ingredients, which have a lot of data on their negative activity in various, for various endpoints. 
So once we put together our botanical library, we moved into sourcing and chemical analysis. So here it started with the botanical selection from all of the different technical working groups, then working with our pharmacognosy group to identify reliable sources of those botanical ingredients. We a lot of times got raw ingredients and had to um, prepare them, had to do the extraction process. We got a lot of help from Iklas Khan in that effort. Next, we went to our chemical analysis phase. So looking at HPTLC authentication, looking at extract solubility determination and constituent identification where possible, where we have analytical standards, and then contaminant, some level of contaminant analysis. And at that point, we're ready to move on to our in vitro assays. So to give you a little bit more detail on what the botanical chemical analysis looked like, um, first of all, we have a separate analysis that was kind of our pilot on ashwagandha that was performed by PNG. And you can find a presentation in our website. The 2021 annual meeting recording is available at the link provided here. Um, so you can see um, Dr. Sika talking about the PNG ashwagandha analysis. For the other, the next botanicals, we have six different laboratories that have been involved in that analytical work. Oregon State University with Richard Van Bremen has been involved, University of Mississippi, there Iklas Khan leads the effort, Penn State University, we have Josh Kellogg working on some of the botanicals. At Here at NIEHS, Ramia Waidanatha is our lead chemist on this effort. Alchemist Labs with Alon Sudberg has been involved and our HPTLC association with Ika Reich. We have been doing ultra high performance liquid chromatography and um, mass spec to quantify known constituents using available reference chemicals and proposed identify, uh, identification of constituents using UHPLC HRMS. And if you have more questions about the chemical analysis, I will definitely defer to our chemistry group experts on those. So to give you an idea of the workflow for assay evaluation, we start out with selecting the treatments. Ideally, we have chemical positive controls because these assays were developed with single chemicals in mind. So a lot of times that's where the controls are, um, chemical negative controls. Then we have our proposed botanical ingredient positives and our botanical ingredient negatives. And then we have all the other botanicals in the library. So the rest, the remaining botanicals in the library, because we're trying to test the entire library in most cases in each of the assays, even if it wasn't nominated by that particular working group. So next we have to think about the exposure paradigm and the duration of the exposure. We then have a list of endpoints that's measured in each assay. Then we generate the data and do analysis work. So here is just an example of what that might look like in graphical form. Then we need to compare our Botanical Safety Consortium generated data to that whole body of existing animal and human toxicity data. Next, we plan to refine and retest as needed, potentially adding assays if we have limited biological coverage or assays don't perform as expected. And once we get through that iterative process downstream, again, moving towards the end goal of integrating that all into a framework for assessing botanical safety. So next, I wanna provide you with um, an overview of where we are at this moment in evaluating the assays for use with our botanical mixtures. So here is each of the working groups and the assays that they have identified currently. Bolded, we have begun work on those assays. And green, we already have a draft of the data completed. So you can see we've made a lot of progress in many areas. Of course, the dermal toxicity group just came online, so we're not expecting them to have identified any assays yet. But you can see we're moving forward with many different assays. 
So what will we do with the data? First, we want to understand the results within each of the assays itself. So was the run valid? Are we getting um, are we getting data that makes sense essentially? And what are the differences compared to the controls? Next, we want to understand the results of the assays compared to the whole body of existing toxicity data. That includes what we have about human data, in vivo animal data, and mechanistic information. Then we want to focus on the screening tools, recommend assays and approaches that could be used in the future, and make sense of the results. So uh, a positive in an in vitro assay doesn't necessarily translate to um, adverse events in a human. So we have to understand what our threshold of effect means. And finally, we have to contextualize the data using the toxicokinetic information that um, groups like the IVIVE um, technical working group are, are working on and generating right now. So that's what we're gonna do with the data, but we don't want it only to be useful within the Botanical Safety Consortium, of course. So what can others do with these assays and with the data that we're generating? Well, hopefully they can use the assays to screen new or data poor botanicals that are out there. Maybe someone's making a mix of multiple botanicals and they wanna compare that to a single botanical ingredient product. We also, um, others can use it to screen and compare products available on the market to look at variability in biological activity. Um, other groups can use it to either prioritize botanicals for additional animal testing if there are worrying, troubling signs in these assays, or they can use it to deprioritize botanicals for animal testing if they are negative across the board and just in general to fill knowledge gaps. And hopefully it can be extrapolated to other types of complex mixtures and used in other spaces. So now I'd like to move on to some updates since the last annual meeting. We have been very, very busy with outreach in 2023. We've had a session at the Tox Forum winter meeting, a session at the Society of Toxicology meeting, um, two posters also at that meeting. We've had a session at the International Conference on the Science of Botanicals meeting. We've had a session on the annual meeting of the Society for Medicinal Plant and Natural Product Research, a session at the American Society of Pharmacognosy, two posters at the Environmental Mutagenesis and Genomics Society meeting, one poster at the Safety Pharmacology Society, um, a, a poster at the ETS meeting um, and a poster at the Italian Latin American ethnomedicine um, meeting, as well as, as Connie mentioned at the beginning, a session is now accepted from our hepatotoxicity group for SOT 2024 in Salt Lake City, Utah. So I hope to see many of you there. Uh, a little review of our peer-reviewed publications from the last year. Through our global outreach efforts, we have put out this paper on potential pharmacokinetic interactions with concurrent use of herbal medicines and a retinavir-boosted COVID-19 protease inhibitor in low- and middle-income countries. So this was led by Dallas Smith. You can get a link to the paper using the QR code, handy QR code. There's just a, a visual uh, graphic from the paper describing some of the work. So that's one effort. Another is um, this paper that came out recently in Regulatory Toxicology and Pharmacology with many BSc authors contributing. Um, here, the title of the paper is Improving the Rigor and Utility of Botanical Toxicity Studies, Recommended Resources. And we really intended this paper to be a guide for people who are trying to do toxicology work on botanical ingredients to improve the literature in the future um, and confirm what they're testing and how they're 
gathering information and just provide a whole lot of resources. So here's just a snapshot of the supplemental, some of the supplemental files. You can see that we've provided many different resources for where to find background information on nomenclature and other areas. And then we've provided a template where you can gather and organize that information to collect preclinical information, for example, adverse reactions, and where you can look for that information, how you can um, capture that in order to be really informed as you move forward in, in testing. And this is probably um, my most exciting slide are all the publications that are coming down through the, the path now. So um, we have a whole bunch of strategy papers and these are really aimed at the technical working groups providing, articulating exactly how they picked the botanical ingredients they selected, the, both positive and negative, and why they decided to focus on the particular assays that they selected. So we have strategy papers in development from the cardiotoxicity group, the developmental and reproductive toxicity group, the hepatotoxicity group, the neurotoxicity group, and the genotoxicity group. And in addition to that paper, in collaboration with another HESI group that focuses on genotoxicity, that group is also working on a paper to look at consistency of the AIMS test results. And that's an important assay that they have selected. So that should be interesting and useful to both groups. Um, also, the chemical analysis group has a strategy paper for the entire botanical library and how they're um, going about doing the analysis, an overview of that. And Saramia Widenatha is leaving, leading that effort. Um, in addition, they have many exciting papers on specific methods. So the ashwagandha root method is being led um, by our PNG colleagues, milk thistle methods by Richard Van Freeman, and blue cohosh methods by Josh Kellogg. We also have the ADME group that is working on three papers, an in silico case study, um, another paper on estimating pharmacokinetic properties of botanicals, and a third paper on estimating PCAM properties of botanicals. And finally, in our global outreach, we have two papers in the works. One is an evaluation of traditional and complementary medicines in Malawi, and that's um, being led by Narinda, and then uh, one on Aristolochia hawkeye and a chemical analysis project on that particular botanical ingredient. So um, with that, I think we have a little bit of time for questions, but now I will just thank you so much for your attention and say it's been wonderful to be a part of the Botanical Safety Consortium over the past year. And I thank will you. stop sharing. Yeah, thank you so much, Cynthia. That was a really excellent uh, overview and update. We do have a few minutes for questions. If there's any from the audience, you can either raise your hand or put it into the chat. Taking a look. It was a very clear presentation. Questions? <laughs> Last call. I see one hand. Dan? Oh, yes. And uh, just thank you very much, uh, Cynthia, for such excellent uh, talk and such uh, report. So my quick question is uh, the material to prepare the reason for the chemical to extract. Okay. Um, What's that human relevant, how they use, they actually use versus, you know, it's a laboratory for your purpose to do the toxic ecology. Thank you. That's a great question. And I will, I, I saw that Saramia is online. Saramia, do you want to take that one? Sure, I'll try. So, sorry, can you repeat the question? It was about the relevance of the extracts that we actually created versus what people are taking yeah. and exposed to. So, so the extracts, you know, um, as, as you recall, that we decided to use ethanolic extracts because to be consistent across all the botanicals and also for convenience. But chemical analysis is, is going to show us whether those extracts have the um, correct constituents, right? So as for the human relevance, you know, so I think 
per Cynthia's uh, presentation, she highlighted that the one of the purpose of this is to identify the assays, right, for the for the certain toxicity endpoints. So these extracts are not exactly relevant to what humans are probably taking because the extraction processes are probably different. But we are going to confirm that the the, the known active or known you know uh, major market concerns are present in these extracts, you know, which have been reported in the literature as being present in the uh, supplements humans are taking. Does that? Yeah, so to that is which makes sense of how difficult it is. Uh, but I probably just put some comment. Yeah. The, uh, it's not just uh, the compensation, it's the ratio, right? Is the, you know, in the extract, uh, the human they do this uh, in vitro versus the human take it in vivo, you know, those can also contribute to that variation. Correct, and and also the mixture, like it has a whole lot of, you know, not a single compound, maybe it's a mixture that is causing the effects, right? Yes, there will right, be, yeah. Lot of, yeah, a lot of unknowns, but you know, this TBD, like you know, I mean, there's a lot we are learning from this process in the consortium as well as there's a lot of literature we had to go back and yes, look at. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Saramia, for being on the spot. <laughs> And yeah, there was just one in the chat. I did see you answer it. Um, there was a question about the use of aquatic plants and you did answer, Cynthia. We didn't particularly exclude them. They just didn't rise to the top as having existing human data for our specific endpoints that we selected. Um, it, it wasn't any reason to exclude them. They are complex mixtures. I believe Tanya's talk later today about NCI's library, they have some um, different aquatic and I think like coral reefs and really different types of botanicals. So that might be interesting to hear what's been out there and what's working to be characterized. Um, there was one last one from Ibrahim before we move on, Cynthia, if you're okay, um, I'll reread the question. Are there any chances of accessing the service of the consortium for the chemical analysis in the case of identifying a botanical poison in a clinical setting? <laughs> That's a really interesting question, Ibrahim. I would, I think the best point would maybe just be to email us and follow up. It wouldn't be directly consortium work, but because this is a great network of people, we could probably connect you and maybe try and see what we can do to help and support. Cynthia, do you want to add to that? That was exactly what I was going to say. Connie, you took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah, I think um, especially if we know, you know, what the target organ was, maybe we can put you in contact with the right people. And um, but I guess this is about chemical analysis specifically. I mean, I, I don't know if it could be part of our global outreach efforts, um, but that that seems like something that we could talk about further. Definitely can discuss. All right. Well, let's everyone thank Cynthia for her excellent talk. Thank you so much.